Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. So, Season of the Deep is fast approaching. Before we start that season, I figured we should go over a little bit about what we know about Titan and its deep, dark oceans. And yes, I said oceans plural for a reason there. Also, separately, before we began all of that, I wanted to give you an update on another lore topic, which is just the fate of Ashamir. Super quick, because it's not the main topic of the video, but very quickly because, well, there are bits of lore that I just didn't get to previously. In my last few videos, from way back when, I discussed the idea that we should rescue Ashamir from the Vex network, and to cut a very long story short, the opportunity for that has probably passed. The scribe trace shell, attainable from getting all three exotic catalysts, tells us about the conclusion of Asher's story, and it tells us about the moment where he was overridden by the Vex network, and, well, his last thoughts were simply, no one can stop it, there is no sense in even trying. I figured I'd give you that little update, given that I didn't manage to get to it in my earlier videos in the season on Asher, and whilst that final comment of Asher's may bode pretty poorly for our fates going forward, let's not think about that existential dread, and let's instead think about the dread of the deep blue seas. Okay, yeah, let's talk about Titan's oceans. So earlier I talked about Titan's oceans plural, and there's a reason for that in Titan's case in particular. In Destiny's history, the moon of Titan was colonized by humanity and they built a floating arcologies on the waves of its oceans. Titan at this point was a world whose surface was covered by liquid methane. Liquid methane as opposed to methane gas because the temperature outside on Titan in an unprotected area is something like minus 180 degrees Celsius. That's almost minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who are using freedom units as you call them. The point is that it's really cold out there and that means that the methane on Titan isn't a smelly gas, it's much more of a smelly liquid. As for how Guardians can survive out in the cold of Titan without freezing to death, I defer to the good old phrase of because of video games. Seriously, let's not get caught up on that little detail when we have personal shielding and all sorts of space tech MacGuffins to see us through. Let's just let the sci-fi be sci-fi. So Titan's ocean is made entirely of methane, right? Yes. But you see, that's just the ocean that we've seen. That's the first ocean. Yes, there are two oceans. That is the upper ocean, the ocean that you can see above the surface. But if you take a terrifying plunge and follow the long boy in the soup down below the waves, you'll start to see that things are a little bit more... terrifying. Because the murky darkness ends and then there's an even deeper, murkier darkness. You see, the arcologies give us a key idea as to why this is. They are floating cities in Titan, of course, but they don't just float on the waves like a ship. I can imagine that's fine for some, but for people who get seasickness, well, I mean, imagine that's 1% of people across an entire colony. Yeah, they'd need a lot more Roombas. No, the Arcologies are not floating on the water itself, they are instead held up by massive support columns attached to their base, and these columns plunge into the ocean floor until they hit the bottom of the methane ocean. That methane ocean ends when it hits something solid. In this instance, that solid something is ice a massive layer of ice that forms the floor of Titan's first methane ocean. This is the solid surface that the Arcologies were anchored to, but it represents the start of something much scarier. You see, the ice is not methane ice, it's actually water ice, as in the stuff that you can drink. But remember, this is Titan, and the temperature is minus 180 degrees Celsius, that is 180 degrees below the freezing point of water. So when you do get to the bottom of the methane ocean, which is an ocean only because it's so cold, you eventually reach the water, which is frozen solid and is not melting at any time soon, because it is still deathly cold down there. But if you go down far enough, the ice does in fact actually turn to water eventually, because lo and behold, when you get closer to the cores of planets, the cores of planets, or planetoids and moons in this instance, can still be quite hot. So, if you go down far enough, you will in fact break through that sheet of ice that the Arcologies are mantled to, and you will instead find the second ocean of Titan. A deeper, vast second water ocean that is so much larger, and that nobody, as best we know in Destiny's timeline, has actually explored. However, that may well change within the Season of the Deep, and it may well be the ocean that we're interacting with. And if it is, well, the Season of the Deep just got a whole lot deeper. 
From here we can start to learn about the lore of Titan and its oceans, and we should really look into the Last Days of Kraken Mare lore book from back in Shadowkeep to do that. This tells us all about the events that unfolded on Titan during the Collapse. There's a ton of stuff that might well be relevant to the Season of the Deep within the lore book, and I'll probably refer back to it at least once or twice in the season, if not heavily, if it does factor into those moments, but for the moment, I wanted to focus on the bits relevant to Titan's oceans. The information we learn from the lore book tells us about Titan's water ocean, the lower of the two oceans, and in particular that there was a long-running project on Titan whose aim was to access it. The crew of the new Pacifica Arcology were making use of submersibles and other equipment to create a borehole to cut through the ice below Titan's methane ocean into the deeper water ocean. According to the law book, just before the collapse started, they had almost completed the borehole and were preparing to dive deep into the unknown for the first time. In Titan's methane ocean, small creatures had been discovered, some of which scientists had successfully captured for study. Down in the deeper water ocean of Titan, who knows what might exist. Unfortunately, the team of researchers on Titan would never get to find out. The arrival of the Pyramid Fleet would then start the collapse and would devastate Titan's arcologies and would kill all the people who were attempting to evacuate. Those, however, were only the effects of what happened above ground on the arcologies. Below the waves, well, a lot more was actually going on. And to understand it, you need to actually know what the Witness did properly to Titan in that moment to cause such a calamitous disaster. This is the power of the Witness and the Pyramid Ships. Gravity. Using the power of the Pyramid Ships, the Witness began to change the shape of Titan by creating gravity at one point on it. If you remember the whole bit from the Books of Sorrows about the CCG and how Fundament was supposedly to be consumed by a massive tidal wave of apocalyptic proportions, this is a really similar idea as to what happened on Titan. You see, the Pyramid Ships began to pull on Titan, creating a force of gravity, changing its structure so that it was getting pulled by one particular point. Most of the time, planets, or planetoids and moons, are spheroid, or at the very least they're potato-shaped, and they keep that stable shape. However, in the instance of Titan with the pyramid ships, the sphere that Titan was was being pulled into an ovoid shape, into something that was more akin to an egg. So I want you to imagine that for just a second. There's this entire planet, and it starts getting pulled, even just a little bit, from a spheroid into an ovoid, from something like, say, a basketball into an egg. This change in gravity wasn't just pulling the planet and all its matter upwards towards that new point of gravity, it was pulling the oceans too. It pulled the liquid methane and the liquid water and the ice, all of them at the same time. Once enough of it had been gathered, however, the pyramid ships turned that gravitational force off, and the planet was then set back into a spheroid shape. The gravity returned to normal, but remember now, we have a ton of water at one spot. One spot from which all of it started to fan out across the planet, thus creating a massive tidal wave. Now you see, that is the moment at which the flooding on Titan became a problem, because when it comes down to it, on a planetary scale, it wasn't actually that big, you know? The wave that was created was about 50 meters tall, which compared to the rest of the planet really isn't that much. But to us human beings, 50 meters tall, I will remind you, is 150 feet. Yeah, that's a bigger tidal wave than most buildings that we've built on Earth. So it's a pretty devastating thing to suddenly happen. Below the waves, something even more dramatic was happening though. As Titan's arcologies were getting absolutely destroyed by these things, the wave of methane spreading out across the moon, well, it was also being followed by a wave of water that was rippling with force below the sheet of ice that separated the two oceans. The last days on Kraken Mare law book seems to imply that the force of this wave was enough to decimate the icy barrier between the two oceans and shatter it in many places as the wave passed across the surface of Titan. The Arcology leadership teams would manage to decouple the support pylons that held the Arcologies up from the icy floor, thus saving the Arcologies from that particular wave of destruction, as it would have shaken them apart from their foundations and they would have just sunk. 
This meant that they would no longer be subject to simply falling and sinking into the waves, they just had to survive the one cataclysmic apocalyptic wave and, well, we can step on the arcologies today as a result of that choice. The thing is, there are other elements that this would have disrupted, and one of them was the borehole. Yeah, the thing that the scientists were drilling so that they could get from one of Titan's oceans into the other? The fate of the borehole remains unknown. And that is really important, because, well, we need to look at what may have happened as a result of that. Imagine for a second, if you will, that the borehole was properly opened. That would lead a straight and somewhat clear pathway from one of the oceans, the lower water ocean where unknown things may dwell, into the upper ocean where things were still relatively known. And on that note, let's talk just briefly about the possibilities here as pertains to the long boy in the soup. And I need to preface this by saying that this is the thing that I want to cover predominantly in future videos. But this is why I think these two oceans and the distinction and understanding the two of them is important. Because the scientists from the Golden Age never saw this thing. They had no idea it existed. They didn't know even for a second that it was a thing. They had no inkling. There is nothing listed in Kraken Mare that tells us this. They even go through and state that the largest life they found was quote-unquote dolphins. I don't believe these to be the actual Earth dolphins, of course. I do, however, believe that if you're going to sit there and call something a dolphin, it should at least be comparable in size to a small porpoise. So, no. When you sit there and you see the long boy in the soup, the word leviathan or behemoth comes to mind, not the word dolphin. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the scientists of the Golden Age never saw the long boy in the soup. You know what they also never saw? The water ocean, deep below. Which tells me that there's a really interesting possibility there, that the long boy in the soup, the massive leviathan, may have come from the deeper ocean of Titan. Now, of course, it's entirely possible as well that the leviathan arrived by some other means on Titan after the collapse, but it's worth just remembering the kind of infrastructure that would be required to support a creature like that. First of all, to support it in space, which is its own terrifying possibility, but secondly as well, to support it within the lower water oceans. There has to be an ecosystem down there, even if it is just filter feeding organisms and microscopic life, that this massive leviathan was supported by. And again, equally, if it came from the stars, there needed to be an apparatus to allow it to survive until it reached Titan. There are 10,000 questions, and there are many implications about what this creature may entail, but I think the most immediate and obvious answer, the one that applies most to Occam's razor, the simple idea that the simplest answer is in fact the correct one, is just this. I think that it came from the deeper ocean. We may well see that that's proved wrong when it comes to Season of the Deep, we have no idea, but ultimately, that's what I think has happened, and that's where I think we will end up going when it comes down to things. So, yeah. It's a long story, but essentially, it's important to know how Titan's oceans work, especially if we're going to what we think is the bottom of one. We may well have literally only scratched the surface of it, because if we're going to go down into the deep water oceans of Titan, well, yeah, we need to know what's down there. And I think this is where our long boy in the soup really comes in. All that being said, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope it gave you a little clarity on the nature of Titan as a moon, because... We've never really had to contemplate going into those oceans and observing it from that perspective. So hopefully this gives you all a little bit of a heads up and you'll be able to actually, you know, understand what's going on a little bit more. Don't be surprised if they talk about multiple oceans on Titan. Don't be surprised if they simplify it a little bit more. Be prepared to understand that there is a difference between the upper and lower reaches of Titan. Be ready to walk on that icy surface, perhaps. God, I hope not. Either way, that's all from me for now. I hope you did enjoy the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like. And if you enjoyed the content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications and to get more of it. Season of the Deep is coming, and soon we will dive in, quite literally. But as per usual, I know that your viewership as always has been quite enough for me, and that my name has been, my name is Bife, Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.